After the first two episodes, we have a very good idea what's in a natural water in a catchment like this. And we also have a very good idea about some main buffering process that governs the pH in the water. In this episode, we're going to put all this knowledge and data together and calculate the acid neutralizing capacity, that is, the buffering capacity of the water based on real data. As we recall from the first video, number one, what's in the water? The water contains about a dozen different ions, and these can be separated into different categories. The first one, are the strong acid anions. So that is simply the anions to strong acids such as hydrochloric acid, sulfuric acid, hydrofluoric acid, and nitric acid. And the second one is the anions to the weak acid. The organic acid with the anion R- bicarbonate and OH-. Regarding cations, we have the cations to the strong bases that is magnesium 2 plus, etc. And finally, we have the cations to the weak base, and those cations are the aluminum species and H plus. In order to develop a useful expression for the buffering capacity, a good starting point is the charge balance. And the charge balance says that the sum of the concentrations of the anions should balance the sum of the concentration of the cations. And more specifically, we have chloride minus etc. as the anions to the strong acids, and we have bicarbonate etc. as anions to the weak acids. And on the right side, we have the cations to strong bases and the cations to the weak bases. The term I use for buffering capacity is acid neutralizing capacity, and that is the concentration of ions capable of neutralizing H. It can be calculated as the difference between the anions to the weak acids that actually are capable of neutralizing H+, and the cations to the bases that are capable of releasing H+. But when we have pulled these two categories out of the charge balance, we see that the A and C must also equal cations to the strong bases minus the anions to the strong acids. These expressions are equally valid, but their first definition includes the different species that actually depend on the H plus concentration, while the second definition contains ions that actually do not react in a normal water. So here we have the data that were recognized from episode one. And the data represent the sample taken at Dolby Söderskog and at the beach forest further upstream in the catchment. I will use these data to calculate the A and C for the beach forest using the two definitions presented earlier in this video. So let's go to the actual A and C calculation. And to the left, I made a template to calculate the A and C as the difference between the cations to the strong bases and the anions to the strong acids. And before we start, I just want to show that I've taken the liberty to add ammonium ions, NH4+, plus, in the template, although NH4+, plus is not present in the water. But it's just to prove the point that NH4+, plus should be considered as a cation to the strong base NH3. So in my tables, I just add the relevant charges of the ions, and I calculate the term in the ANC as the concentration divided by the molar mass times the charge. And then I multiply by 1,000 in order to get into micromoles per liter rather than millimoles. And I just do the same thing. I repeat the calculation and I add them up. And the same thing with the anions. Add the charge. Define the calculation. Concentration divided by the molar mass times the charge. Multiply by 1,000 as a conversion of units. We add them up. And we calculate the A and C as the cations to the strong bases minus the anions to the strong acid. So it's 113 micromoles per liter.
If we should make the calculation based on the difference between anions to the weak acids and the cations to the weak bases, it's a little bit more tedious. But to start from the beginning, we have a certain amount of DIC with a certain molar mass, and that is 12. But we need to figure out how much of the DIC that's present as bicarbonate. And then we can use this diagram that we looked at in episode 2. And what we see is that at pH 6.8, about two-thirds of the DIC is present as bicarbonate. So in our calculation, we add the fraction 0.66, and the charge is 1. So the A and C term will be the amount of DIC divided by 12 times the fraction, that is bicarbonate, times the charge, times 1,000 for a conversion. So it turns out to be 85. When it comes to the DOC, what we have to do is to take the DIC, multiply it by a factor of 7 times 10 to the minus 6, but also the amount of the DOC that are in the anionic form. And if we bring up this diagram showing the degree of protolysis versus the pH, we see that virtually all of the organic acids, organic anions, are in the anionic form. So let's put a 0.99 there, and the charge is 1. We take the concentration, multiply by 7, multiply by 0.99, and multiply by 1. And then we automatically get it in micromoles per liter. We add them up and get 149.9. Now the H+, plus, we just take the charge of 1. So that's right. Okay, we take the concentration of H+, plus, multiply by the charge, 6, in order to get it into micromoles per liter. And with aluminium, we add the constant, which is 10 to the 9th. That's a kg value. The charge is 3, and we get the constant times the hydrogen ion cube times 3, times 1 to the 6th in order to get it in micromoles, which is close to nothing. So we add these up and calculate the A and C as the difference between the anions and the cations. Now you may feel it's disturbing that one calculation showed that A and C is about 113 micromoles per liter, while the others pointed at 140 micromoles per liter. And the reason is that it's based on real lab data. And in one case, A and C is calculated as a small difference between two large numbers, and in the other case, it's calculated basically from assumptions regarding DIC and DOC. So the mismatch is not large. In fact, it's really small and it points at the high quality from the lab here at the college building.